Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, one of the more magnificent of non-predatory wild animals in the United States is the desert bighorn sheep. This handsome animal once was abundant throughout the mountainous desert southwest, but has gradually diminished in number. The Utah Division of Wildlife Resources has inaugurated a program intended to expand both the territory and population of desert bighorns. One such area in southeastern Utah, where this program is taking place, is here in the area of Lake Powell, which is an impoundment of the Colorado River. In this beautiful area of natural habitat, which is so ideal for the desert bighorn sheep, there are substantial numbers of animals on one side of the Colorado River, but not on the other. The river forms a natural barrier, and even though the habitat is the same on both sides of the Colorado, all of the bighorns are found only on this side. We are here at the invitation of the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources to observe what is being done to improve the desert bighorn situation. With me is the man who is in charge of the wildlife of southeastern Utah and who can explain the project in progress here. He is Utah game manager, Jim Bates. On this side of the river, the desert bighorn sheep population has been increasing. Through use of the helicopter, we are now attempting to relocate animals from the herd here to new areas of natural habitat across the Colorado River. Just how this ambitious project is being accomplished is what Jim is going to show me now. Let's go. Waiting for us only a short distance away is the helicopter that will take us to the Gypsum Canyon area. Our pilot is Will Sargent. Helicopters are the only reasonable form of transportation here for the Desert Bighorn Relocation Project. But even some helicopters have their limitations. This one is ideal to get us to our destination, but not the best for flying close to the canyon walls after running sheep, and hasn't room enough to transport immobilized animals. For that, we'll transfer to a more specialized helicopter later on. Here at Gypsum Canyon, these towering bluffs topped by broad mesas are composed primarily of sandstone, weathered into sheer cliffs. This difficult desert terrain averages only four inches of rainfall annually, but desert bighorns can survive here very well. This same hostile terrain was once also the home of a primitive tribe of Indians who for protection rather amazingly built their structures in what seems to be inaccessible fissures of the cliff face. We'll ask our pilot to hover here for a moment while we take a closer look. These cliff dwellings were constructed about a thousand years ago by the Anasazi Indians, who according to Jim Bates were ancestors of the Hopi and Pueblo Indians. Much archaeological research is done at these sites by various universities. Here's our first sighting of the desert bighorns. The ability with which they run over the loose rock rubble is astounding. This is a fairly typical herd in size. Most individual herds are from four to eight animals. The necessity of using helicopters to locate and immobilize such agile animals is quite evident. In this stark yet beautiful habitat, one of the objects of the Desert Bighorn Project is to study some of the other animal life here which may affect the sheep. One such animal is the cougar or mountain lion. It's the largest predatory species of this habitat, but Jim Bates says they seldom kill bighorns. They are quite swift when running over relatively level areas and also quite skillful in climbing among the rocks of the canyons.
occasionally a cougar such as this one will catch and eat a lamb or inexperienced yearling. But much more often they feed on the mule deer of this area. The research done here since 1969 indicates rather conclusively that while cougars are more plentiful on the west side of the Colorado River, where the sheep are being relocated, they're still not abundant and not considered to be any threat to the project. Much more to be contented with as predators than the cougars like this one, Jim observes, are two other principal predators of this terrain, bobcats and coyotes. We'll leave this cougar now and head directly for our rendezvous with the other helicopter not too much farther ahead. We are now about 40 miles from where we started and have finally reached the point where we'll transfer to the capture helicopter. This is where we'll land on the flat area of the Mesa. We won't be needing this helicopter for the capturing of any desert bighorns, so we'll let our pilot return to his base. There's the chopper we'll use. With its more streamlined shape, greater power, and different rotors, this craft is extremely maneuverable, which is precisely what's essential for flying into the canyons and close to the cliff walls. That's what we'll soon be doing as we head out to locate and immobilize a desert bighorn. A lot of mining for copper, gold, uranium, and other ores occurs in this area, and that mineral exploration, along with recreational uses, disrupts natural habitat. The weird rock formations and ancient ruins attract sightseers, campers, and archaeologists. And that also tends to disturb or harass the nervous sheep. For survival, the desert bighorns need the solitude these heretofore isolated canyons provided. We'll begin searching where the sheep are most often found between elevations 3,500 and 7,000 feet in the talus at the cliff base. Almost immediately, we encounter a herd following its leader. The bighorns are incredibly sure-footed in their swift run across the treacherous loose rubble. Our first problem is to select and isolate the specific sort of animal most ideal for relocating, usually used from two to three years old, and rams three to four years old. This ram is about six years old, a fact indicated by the size of its horns. Big horns become frightened when pursued by helicopter, but the fear passes quickly with no long-term disruptions. The ram's too old, so we'll try to find a ewe in a herd that Jim considers suitable for the sheep relocation project. That's a task somewhat more difficult. The ewe must be healthy and the correct age, a factor determined by its actions, general configuration, and size in relation to the other sheep of the herd. Jim is expert in making such determinations from above. It's important not to chase the big horns excessively, and even though to the inexperienced eye they look alike, Jim has spotted a young ewe suitable for the project. She may begin running, so the shot must be quick. The dart has struck a ewe in the hind leg. The immobilizing agent is a drug called M99. Jim keeps his gaze locked on the darted animal so we won't lose track of it. The target animal will soon be fully immobilized, and Jim's dart also contained a shock suppressant to minimize discomfort. We've kept the darted animal in view all this while, and now that it has gone down, we can land relatively close by.
The immobilized you is conscious. It's important not to frighten the sheep unduly. So while Jim approaches it alone and quickly takes steps to calm it, I'll wait here. His first step is to quickly check the animal to make sure it is in sound physical condition. The dart is removed immediately so it will not continue to be an irritation in the flesh. It can be used again. The next step will be to further calm the young sheep by winding a blindfold over its eyes. This will remain on until the processing is completed and will keep the ewe calm even in the event the drug wears off before the animal is released. In all cases, the operation is carried out with a minimum of handling. With the preliminaries over, the immobilized desert bighorn sheep can be brought to the helicopter for loading and transported to a field location where other work can be completed in the relocation process. The capture helicopter's back floor has enough space to accommodate the sheep comfortably. A major objective of the project is to relocate these bighorns to new areas which are not so subject as areas east of the river to livestock overgrazing, mineral exploration, and various forms of public recreation which disrupt the isolation the sheep require. The relocation project, begun in 1975, is already showing promising results. Since that time, a total of 42 sheep, like the one just darted, have been successfully relocated west of the Colorado River. In just a few minutes from now, at the field station a short distance from here, we will be processing this newly darted sheep and then transporting it to the new habitat. We've been aloft only a few minutes, but already we're approaching the area where our immobilized sheep will be processed. We've been in radio contact with the waiting game personnel here, so they are ready for our arrival. The Southern Utah Regional Game Manager, Floyd Coles, is making final preparations. The immobilized sheep will now have its age accurately determined through horn characteristics and be swiftly and thoroughly examined for physical condition. Only if this animal is found to be perfectly fit will the relocation process continue. At the processing area, we are joined by the project veterinarian, Dr. Richard K. Hedelius, better known as simply Doc, who has processed many of these animals. His first concern is to check the heartbeat and to make certain the ewe is not suffering from shock or having other internal problems. While he does this, and I assist by holding the ewe's head steady, Floyd Coles prepares to inject the antidote called M55. This reversal antagonist drug is injected intramuscularly in twice the dosage of the original M99. The recovery time will be short. Working quickly as a team, we're now ready to put on the identification collar. At the same time, Doc will be taking a blood sample. The collars are color-coded to specific years, this year's being yellow and highly visible for long distances. The blood sample has been taken, and now Floyd Coles fits an aluminum ear tag into pliers for attaching onto the ewe's ear as a permanent marker having a specific number. It is the same number which appears on the similar tag attached to the collar. Now, except for a final antiseptic treatment of the dart wound, we're nearly finished. Floyd sprays the antibiotic liberally over the wound to prevent infection. 
and then helps the rest of us work at getting the sheep into a strong but heavy bag of soft canvas, which along with the blindfold will keep the sheep contained and calm. Since the antidote was injected and full recovery will be occurring soon, the canvas bag will be tied securely. This helps prevent the sheep from jumping around and possibly injuring itself. As always, the welfare of the animal is a primary concern in this and all other operations involved in the project. With the work of both Floyd and Doc completed, it is time now for Jim and me to get the sheep back into the helicopter and to the release site as soon as possible. None of this is easy. It requires enormous outlays of time, energy, equipment, and money. But it is necessary to do so if we are to correct the damage man himself has done. The release site is on the other side of the Colorado River, and it won't take long in the helicopter to get there. The job is not over with the work on this sheep. Many more will also be relocated in the future, for this project is a continuing one. Just recently, five more relocation sites were approved in addition to the one we are currently heading for. Skimming over the rocky plateau, we've quickly come upon the Colorado River. That barrier the Bighorns have never been able to cross by themselves. Almost immediately after crossing the river, we've come upon the only wild herd of bison in the lower 48 states. There are about 200 animals in this herd, and they are as fiercely wild as any bison herd that roamed America in our early history. trip to the release area is behind us now, and our landing site is directly below. This is the area called the Escalante, where other bighorns have been released and are doing so well, far removed from many of the disturbances east of the river. In doing this work, we cannot help but realize that if many years ago even small sums were spent for preservation of habitat and wildlife, large sums would not have to be spent now to restore them. Little by little, man is learning from past errors and omissions. Now, in using new technologies and much improved methods and equipment, such as the helicopter, this relocation project proves that game animals can be preserved and their range expanded. Although during our flight, the ewe recovered from the immobilization drug, she is still a bit wobbly on her feet. That will pass very quickly. Within another hundred feet or so, her faculties will be fully returned. That sheep we just released and others like it, which are being relocated on this range, hold a bright promise for the future. They are the nucleus of a program to reestablish the desert bighorn populations here. It is too early yet to be certain of the results, but Utah wildlife officials are optimistic and believe that soon this new area will be the home of a large population of desert bighorn sheep. 
The wildlife relocation program being undertaken in the Lake Powell region of Utah is breathing new life into the desert bighorn sheep population. It is giving these fine animals a new opportunity to extend their range and increase their total population. At the same time, research on the cougar will provide important data on the relationship between the cougar and other wildlife species of this beautiful land, including the natural balance to be maintained. The efforts being made by the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources provides a good example for other states to follow in preserving wildlife. It also indicates that man can sometimes use his technology to restore a proper natural balance in the wild kingdom.